2020 has seen Christmas cancelled for most people in the UK, let alone the world. And as London has had some of the strictest restrictions imposed on it just a few days before the big day, this means that Christmas in the capital this year just won't be the same. London has long been a city that knows how to celebrate this festive period, managing to attract people from all over the country and even the world to celebrate alongside with them. Even though the full festivities may not be going ahead this year, I thought we could still celebrate and take a look at some Yuletide favourites. Today on the Carb London for our special Christmas Day episode, we'll be uncovering a traditional London Christmas. <laughs> if you've ever been to London in December, you'll notice a delightful juxtaposition of a bustling metropolis bedecked with twinkling lights, choirs singing carols, busy Christmas shoppers, and many a sleeping Santa missing his stop on the tube after having one too many sherries at the office Christmas party. London nowadays is a popular destination for people wishing to experience a traditional English Christmas. Many of the customs that are celebrated in English-speaking countries around the world, such as the USA, feature elements that have been borrowed from English culture, but the country as a whole is mainly touted as having stolen, or should that be stolen, from Germany, but this isn't necessarily true. Christmas in the capital as we recognise it today can be traced back to Victorian culture due to Charles Dickens, the writer and social commentator of the time writing his famous story, A Christmas Carol. Dickens was inspired to write his winter's tale after having read a government-issued report in 1843, where he became increasingly appalled at its contents. In the report, women and children were being given no other option than to work long hours without rest, in squalid, dangerous and unsanitary conditions. Dickens felt that he had to make a comment on the social inequalities of the poor, and he knew that he would be able to write a story that would hopefully tug on the heartstrings of those who could make a difference. When writing A Christmas Carol, Dickens wanted to portray the extreme poverty he had witnessed as a London resident, but also to convey a message that all could be made right if people looked to themselves and opened their hearts. When it was published in 1843, it was an immediate hit, selling over 6,000 copies in just over a month. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but given the literacy rate, this was quite something. Even Queen Victoria was inspired by Dickens's book, but probably more so by her German husband, Prince Albert. Victoria was relatively new to the throne when Dickens began his writing career, and society as a whole looked to the young queen to set the fashion for the time. With her marriage to Prince Albert in 1840, she adopted much of the German traditions that he practised around Christmas, such as a decorated tree, presents, and a feast of epic proportions on the day itself. Up until 1834, Christmas Day wasn't celebrated as anything out of the ordinary. It was just another working day. Papers would be published, shops would be open, and life would continue as normal. Only after this date was the day considered a public holiday, and people would cease their regular routine in order to attend church for the day. The commercialisation seen in A Christmas Carol was a proportionate reaction to changing fashions at the time. Inside the Queen's Palace, decorated trees would be hung from the chandeliers, presents were placed under the tree, and due to the use of real candles on the branches, fires were a regular occurrence, but luckily nothing so serious as to harm the royal family. People looked to the royals in a way which has been lost to us now with modern celebrity, but back then they were the trendsetters of the day, and the traditions they observed filtered down to the general public, and has subsequently inspired the way we do things now. Prince Albert may be regularly credited for the cultural importation of the Christmas tree, but it was in fact Queen Caroline, wife of King George II. Caroline originally brought the tradition of decorating a tree over from Germany in 1714, when she permanently moved to London after her husband became the Prince of Wales, and the tradition of placing trinkets upon the tree was instilled in the great British public. 
Well, those who could afford baubles, which would have been reserved for much richer households than most. Those that didn't have enough money to spend on tree trinkets could make their own by using household items to create papier-mâché and decorate them by making their own paint. The trend of having handmade decorations even transposed over to mass production techniques, and well into the 1940s, decorations still had a handmade feel to them as the aesthetic was quaint and cosy, even though they may have been a little more bedecked with modern materials like glitter. Even though Caroline is said to have brought in the tradition of decorating the tree, the origins of having a tree inside the home seem to go back much further, but it wasn't made popular until after the 1840s. As the Industrial Revolution had occurred at the end of the 1700s, London was now a city that made things, and as such, this meant that those things could be created in bulk, especially for the Christmas period. Previously, Christmas gift-giving had been a very minor affair. If gifts were given at all, they would be minimal, such as fruit or sweets for the children, and never ever wrapped. But now, with factories capable of mass-producing toys, children were now given more gifts over the subsequent years, with everything turning up under the tree, from dolls, tin toys, tea sets, and even the fabulous choking hazard of marbles. Parents who couldn't afford presents, once again, got busy with their crafting supplies and made gifts such as peg dolls and cloth toys, and those who were a little more skilled would make rocking horses. The best gift a little boy could receive, though, was a nice bottle of beer. However, before Christmas Day, the festivities would receive a build-up in the form of Christmas cards. Christmas cards didn't become commercially popular until around the 1870s, But before then, a very busy man by the name of Henry Cole found that the amount of Christmas well-wishing letters he was having to write was becoming unmanageable. In 1843, he commissioned an artist to make him a card that he could write a short note upon, which depicted his family upon it so people could see they were all well. Cole was delighted with the design, which showed his lovely family drinking some wine, whilst bookended by two depictions of charitable acts the family had supposedly carried out themselves. This portrayed the family in a good light, and as such, Cole ordered a thousand to be printed so he could circulate them. Later, Henry became the director of the South Kensington Museum, later called the Victoria and Albert Museum, who now hold over 15,000 antique Christmas cards in their collection, and to this day create their own designs based on the old cards from the Victorian era. The invention of the stamp in 1840 also helped to distribute the cards, but they were a rich person's preoccupation until the cost of them dropped significantly, and then they could be purchased in multiple packs from confectioners and tobacconists, but before then they'd been only sold in pairs, for an extortionate nine pence for two. Once the halfpenny post was brought in, this made the sending of cards a far more affordable prospect, and before long, the cards were shaping the Christmas branding we still use today. That is, until cards started to become a little darker. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, I urge you to pop over to the YouTube video so you can see these designs for yourself, as they're quite something. Disturbing cards which depicted everything from dead birds through to Krampus and insects dancing with frogs were sent as conversation starters, as people would place them in their parlours, and the most eye-catching card would mean that the sender would be a topic of conversation in the household. In short, it was the Victorian Christmas equivalent of writing a vague book status and waiting for the requisite, you okay hun, response. That's not the only mildly disturbing Christmas activities the Victorians got up to. Londoners had settled on goose being the traditional Christmas dinner, as it was far more affordable than turkey, which was reserved only for the very rich. In order for the city to be fed on Christmas Day, there would be a procession of an enormous flock of geese, often in the tens of thousands, that would make their way from Norfolk, around a 100 miles away, walking for over a week to get to the market. In order for the geese to make the journey, their feet were covered in tar to make shoes, so they could walk the huge distance without incurring injuries. Once at Leadenhall Market in the city, they'd then be slaughtered. 
one goose, who had other ideas, decided to escape and was later rounded up, but as he seemed to have quite some character, the local tradespeople decided to keep him. They called him Old Tom, and he lived till 37 years old, before passing away of natural causes and being buried in the market. The legend of Old Tom still lives on as the name of a cosy underground bar. It doesn't serve foie gras, though. Once you'd prepared your goose for dinner, you'd be certain to keep a hold of its feathers. Feathers could be dyed green, and then used to make a Christmas tree with wire and down a cheap alternative to the expensive real trees, and it had the bonus of being reusable, so we have the Victorians to thank for the artificial Christmas tree. Now relaxing after Christmas dinner, as all families do, the need for some kind of organised fun arises. The Victorians' parlour games were far more risky than, well, playing risk. One game which seems fairly innocent is the Sculptor a game in which one person would be assigned the role of the sculptor, and the rest of the group would have to be still. The sculptor then sets to work on manipulating their bodies into strange poses, which are hard to hold. The life-sized artworks then need to stay in the pose, and not move or laugh. The first one to laugh, or move, is the loser. This game seems fairly innocent, but when you think of playing it whilst tightly laced into a corset, it suddenly becomes a much tougher task. The next game on the roster of entertainment quickly descends into something much worse. In Are You There Moriarty, two players would lie belly down on the floor and each would be given a rolled up newspaper before being blindfolded. Once they were unable to see each other, they began taking it in turns to shout Are You There Moriarty? They then must swipe their newspaper in the direction of their opponent. Players are allowed to use any means necessary to deceive their fellow Moriarty, including crawling around on the floor, hiding behind furniture, and rolling. For years, this game would be played as a joke on younger players, who would take it in all earnestness and try their best. But little did they know that the older opponent had removed their blindfold long ago and would just hit them until they gave up. Another dangerous game, which proved to be a long-standing Victorian tradition, was the game of Snapdragon, where a bowl full of booze-soaked raisins would be set alight. The name of the game was to remove the flaming fruit and eat it whilst it was still alight. If it went out before it touched your mouth, then you'd have to do a forfeit. Now, I tried this out for a video a few years ago and never succeeded in even lighting the raisins for more than a few seconds, so either the Victorians had super flammable booze or they were just constantly carrying out forfeits. Speaking of forfeits, most of these were saved up until the end of the evening when they'd be carried out in one go, and this was the part of the evening most people looked forward to. If these parlour games were played with multiple households, then the forfeits chosen were very much dependent on if there was anyone in the room that you fancied. Many of the forfeits included kissing, but my favourite one has to be giving compliments to the one person you like the most in the room, without using the letter L. Much harder than it sounds. Again, I tried this for a video a few years back, so I'll leave the link to that so you can go and watch it if you want to see me fail. However... Before the post-dinner revelry erupted into chaos, there had been a new invention being placed upon dinner tables across London that was bringing much joy to the Victorians, and has gone on to become a dinner table staple to this day across the country. A man by the name of Tom Smith, who owned a sweet shop in Clerkenwell in Islington, imported into London some extra special confectionery for the Christmas period, in the hopes this would boost sales at his store. After all, if he could offer something unique, then he could corner the burgeoning Christmas market and cash in on the seasonal spending. The sweet he sold to punters was a French import called bonbons, which contained a sugared almond. These sweets came wrapped in paper and were a good small trinket to pass on to loved ones, and Tom noticed that due to their delicate appearance... They were attracting the attention of men who wanted to buy them for their fancy ladies. Thinking there was more money to be made in some direct marketing, Tom began putting love charms, jewellery and notes inside the paper wrapping, 
and marketed them as love tokens, which boosted sales enormously. However, the novelty only lasted for a short while before sales dropped off, and Tom was left with a lot of little paper parcels that no one wanted. The story goes that one evening, Tom was sitting in front of his fire at home, thinking about how he could come up with a new product when a log on the fire made a crackle noise. He began thinking about how it would be fun if he could make his bonbons do the same. Working with his brother, who was a magician in the music halls, the pair transferred some of the stage magic to the parcels and inserted a paper strip which crackled when the two elements were dragged over each other when opening. Smith bought the elements and design of the snap from a London-based firework maker and then set about making larger packaging to incorporate the snap strip which allowed for larger gifts to be placed inside. The upgraded bonbons were a huge hit, and Smith began marketing them as the rather charmingly named Bangs of Expectation. This later evolved into Cossacks, named after the Slavic soldiers, and later changed once more to the much catchier Christmas Cracker. Sadly, Tom developed stomach cancer and died at the young age of 46, but luckily handed down his business to three of his seven children, who took on the mantle of growing the Cracker Empire. The crackers we know today, with the requisite paper crown, joke and proportionate to the amount of money you've spent on them trinket inside, only came about after Tom's death, as his son included the extra elements to make them unique to the Tom Smith brand. The company still sells crackers to this day, and is the chief supplier to the Queen and the rest of the royal family, so if you fancy a touch of regal indoor fireworks on your Christmas dinner table, then you can purchase them yourself. However, you should not try to take them home in your luggage to America if you're on a trip, as they're strictly banned due to them being labelled as fireworks, despite them being pretty harmless. The Victorians really embraced Christmas as a charitable affair, and took the time to make sure that many of the city's homeless and poor residents were cared for. In 1851, London was emerging as one of the greatest cities in the world, but with the fast growth of the city came the downsides that always accompany rapid expansion. Many people were forced into workhouses, lived in slums or multiple occupancy households, and scraped together a meagre meal or didn't eat at all. Many people died from exposure and starvation, whilst others around them lived in absolute luxury. To try and combat the hunger felt by so many on Christmas Day, a chef, Alexis Sawyer, decided to band together a few philanthropists and wealthy do-gooders from the capital to put on a gargantuan feast for those who would otherwise go hungry. Alexis had experience in cooking for vast amounts of people during the Crimean War and the Great Famine in Ireland, so he was no stranger to batch cooking on a huge scale. In order to carry out the huge operation, and to make sure there was enough room to accommodate the huge queues, Alexis set up an enormous marquee in the considerably well-named Ham Yard from which to serve the food. The dinner wasn't just a queue-up, get-served-and-leave operation, but an actual sit-down meal, with over 300 people being able to be seated every half hour to enjoy their Christmas dinner. However, the food wasn't reserved for just people who could attend the sit-down dinner. Family-sized takeaway servings were also created for those who were caring for ill relatives, had young children, or anyone who just wanted to have a nice meal, but not be around people. The tent was bedecked in Christmas decorations, and a real effort was made to make the marquee a pleasant and welcoming environment. An oasis for a short while from the harshness of the grubby London streets, with even a band playing music. The foods on offer were created to be delicious, and with Alexis's cooking skills, he produced some very fine meals. Amongst the food donated from affluent Londoners consisted of over 300 large pies, including one called the Monster, which weighed £60, which for my English listeners is over four and a half stone. 20 roast geese, 5,000 pounds of plum pudding, 9,000 pounds of roast meats including beef and pork, and over 3,300 pounds of potatoes, and most importantly 5,000 pints of beer. Amazingly, the giant feast managed to feed around 1% of the population of London, 
which amounted to around 22,500 people who had a full belly on Christmas Day. The huge feast on such an enormous scale was never repeated, but it did leave a lasting impression on Londoners, and many Christmas charitable efforts sprung up across the city every Christmas since, and still to this day. London has one of the best provision Christmas Day offerings for people who want to join in a Christmas meal, get a food parcel, or just need a dry and warm place to have a chat with people. However, most of these efforts, much like Alexis's feast, are privately funded affairs and see little to no support from the government. The message of London's Christmas charity is easily understood around the world, but there are a few things that still get lost in translation around the big day. One strange custom, which has never translated to others around the globe, is Boxing Day. The day after Christmas Day has nothing to do with the sport, but instead is thought to have gained its name by people delivering boxes of gifts to each other, particularly in the form of masters giving gifts to servants in richer households. And in 1871, the day became a bank holiday, meaning that people were not expected to work that day. Unlike the nationally celebrated Boxing Day, there are a few modern Christmas traditions that are only observed in the capital. Starting off with something that many people will have seen on TV, but not known the origins of, is the Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square. After the Second World War, Norway decided it would gift London with a stunning spruce tree every year as an annual reminder of their gratefulness. During the Second World War, Britain was Norway's closest ally, and particularly London offered refuge to many Norwegians, helping them to broadcast illegally to the citizens via their radio stations in London. A giant spruce tree is grown especially for the occasion over a number of years, with often three or four trees being grown before the best of the bunch is picked, to be shipped over and then placed in Trafalgar Square for all to see. A visit to see the giant Christmas tree is also often paired with a visit to see the Christmas lights on the shopping streets of Regents and Oxford Street, where shops compete with each other to show off their ever-increasingly extreme shop displays. Even coach tours come from around the country to make trips specifically to show off these displays, and to ship in eager shoppers who unwittingly realise they're helping to boost the capital's economy and not their hometowns. However, there are bargains to be had in the city, as if you're willing to take a gamble on what you'll be eating for Christmas Day, you can head to Smithfield Market, where you can join in with the Christmas meat auction, where market trader Hearts Butchers sell off all of their unsold Christmas meats for next to nothing. If you can bear the hustle and bustle, you could walk away with whole turkeys, a range of different poultry, through to whole joints of beef for a fraction of the cost you'd get it for in the supermarket. As with most things this year, the Christmas meat market won't be going ahead, but it hopes to be back for 2021. One last strange tradition in the capital is something many of us would definitely wince at the thought of. At 9am on Christmas morning, in Hyde Park, you may be shocked to see many people dressed in swimwear. The annual tradition of the Christmas morning swim dates back to 1864, and sees some very brave people diving into the Serpentine Lake. Not content with that being enough, the plunge is also competitive, with people racing to the chilly finish line to win a trophy. The trophy was donated in 1904 by J. M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan, and as such, the prize is called the Peter Pan Cup. As the polar plunge is a little too dangerous for your average Joe, it's restricted to members of the Serpentine Swimming Club, taking part to prevent any unprepared members of the public drowning or having a heart attack due to cold water shock, and thus having a very bad Christmas day indeed. The Christmas traditions in London have definitely evolved over the years, but there's some weird and wonderful traditions that have filtered out from the capital. So this year, as you sit down to your Christmas dinner, Take a look at the Christmas cracker on your table, take a bite of your delicious meal, and think of the travelling geese and the great feast. And even when you unwrap your presents, have a little think of London in all its Christmassy glory before you mutter the words of Dickens and say, God bless us, everyone.
Thank you for joining me for that very special Christmas Day episode of Macabre London and the culmination of the abhorrent advent calendar. If you've made your way through the whole of the advent calendar episodes, then thank you so much for joining me. It's been so much fun seeing everyone enjoying them, reading the reviews that have been coming in, seeing more patrons signing up, and seeing you sharing the show all over the place. I also just want to ask that if you have a few moments and you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube and you've not subscribed yet, then I'm trying to reach a thousand subscribers on YouTube before the end of the year. And seeing as there's many more of you that listen to the podcast than you do watch the YouTube channel, I've only got 100 left to go before I reach that number. So if you could do me a huge favour and head over to do that, that would be a fantastic Christmas present. I'll pop a link to the channel right at the top of the show notes so it's easy for you to do. When you get to my page, just press the big red button. And best of all, it's free. And a huge big thank you if you've already taken the time to subscribe, it means a lot. If you've supported the show by buying a gift from the wishlist, on Amazon, making a donation, or signing up to Patreon, thank you so much, it really does mean the world. And as an extra special thanks to all of our patrons, there's now a ghost story up on the Patreon page. So should you want to hear that as well, it will cost you as little as $1. And again, I'll leave the link in the description to that. Also, I just wanted to say that all the advertising money from this episode will be donated to the Trussell Trust, who are a food bank service, so if you want to increase these donations, then please listen to the adverts on the podcast episodes a few times, so we can boost that money and get a good-sized donation given to them. Also, I just wanted to say that the donations from the ghost story and also the advertising money from this episode will be donated to the Trussell Trust, who are a food bank service. So if you want to increase those donations, then please listen to the adverts on the podcast episodes a few times so we can boost that money and get a good sized donation going to them in January when they need it even more than they do at Christmas. I'll be taking a few weeks break now and submerging myself in mulled wine, so I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and a fantastic New Year, and I will see you back in 2021. Thank you for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. I've been Nikki Druce, have a very Merry Christmas, and I'll see you ghouls next time. We did it everyone, 25 days of episodes, who thought I could do that with my amount of inconsistency, but we did it, yay! That'll do, calm down. (laughs) Merry Christmas. It was all over our carpet now. Oh no, we did it. Merry Christmas, everybody.